We looked at economic development, downtown revitalization, environmental sustainability, green infrastructure, and storm resiliency. We really took all these elements of the, plan, of, um, the purpose of the plan to create a sense of place for Baldwin and the Grand Avenue corridor. We focused on some areas um, that are along the entire corridor, about five or six really core areas. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'd like to look at the Long Island Railroad Station because creating walkable places really does focus on being able to utilize assets such as a train station. So the recommendation for the Long Island Railroad Station was to um, create an overlay district that would um, entice people to use the train station more and to be able to walk and utilize um, other areas. By combining these different types of um, zoning recommendations, we feel that people will feel like there's a sense of place, there's a sense of, there's, there's different, um, <laughs> Adrian is uh, <laughs> speaking over me. Um, there's different um, ways to get around. We can walk, we can use public transportation, bicycle racks, etc. Um, so really, the whole point was also of the study was to incorporate complete streets, so making it safer for people to walk, for pedestrians, and that was part of the study as well. There was an extensive complete streets component, um, and not only for the train station, but for the entire corridor. Creating that sense of place and making people feel safe and want to walk is important, and so com the complete streets aspect of the overlay district that we are now working on actually as a result of this study for the town of Hempstead and Baldwin will encompass all these um, elements of making a walkable place, a safe and walkable place in Baldwin. Okay. Um, so I'm John Chalemi. Um To answer your question, Keith, I think uh, we're making progress but not enough and not quick enough. Um, there are a lot of municipalities that are not, their zoning codes have not yet embraced this concept. A uh, handful have. Um, the panel this morning mentioned quite a few of them. The town of Hempstead has a, um, a floating uh, zone for transit-oriented development, um, which a uh, project that my firm handled is able to utilize and 230 units are going in Oceanside. Um, uh, Baldwin with the overlay district which is just proposed, which is great, it should happen. The overlay district will, I think, really um, is the perfect compromise. It's, it's not going to impede on the underlying zoning, but give opportunity to provide the necessary multifamily or mixed use um, uh, developments that are needed. Um, uh, same thing with Amityville as well. They're trying to create a floating zone, um, which would do the same exact thing. And these floating zones, I think, are are the way to go. Um, they they you could get pretty specific with them. You could um, uh, create the boundaries of where you want it to go, just like the Grand Avenue. They've set the parameters of where they want to see development, and it allows developers to use those boundaries and work within them, kind of sets limitations, if you will, um, flexible limitations, I guess, um, best way to, um, to describe it. But I do think that more needs to happen, zoning codes need to adapt more, um, and I don't think it's the straight overhaul of zoning codes. I do think that it's these creations of additional districts that are applicable to these areas by train stations, um, uh, downtowns that can support the walkable community. I mean, I know for experience that when I moved to Limbrook, the first thing my wife said was, oh, we could walk to here, we could walk to there. On the weekends, our cars do not leave the driveway. We walk everywhere and we have, to, well, she loves it. I guess we have that. Um, she absolutely loves it. And I think that's where we're going as a region, uh, as a country. And uh, I think the municipalities are waking up to it. And I think progress is happening. It's slow, it's a fight, but I think um, uh, cooler heads are prevailing and I think <coughs> things are happening. Where does the resistance come from? Well, I, I personally think the resistance is coming from uh, Long Islanders that don't want that Queens-like feel. Um, and I can now speak to that because I'm from Queens. I grew up <laughs> born and raised in Queens. And let me tell you, when I moved to Long Island, 
I was, I thought it was a complete 180 and I, I thought it was fantastic. I think it would take a lot to turn Long Island into Queens. Um, and, and just a variety of aspects. Um, just uh, traffic. I know Long Island is complaining about traffic and parking. Queens is no picnic either. Uh, I know when I drive into Queens to visit family, the second I cross into the Queens boundary line, I just get the sense of just congestion. Um, and I think that's where it's coming from. Um, the older generation wanting to keep the, the likelihood of community the way it is, which is great, but I think developers are listening to that. They're not suggesting these brick buildings that are going to be eyesores in communities. They're, they're proposing, and the architects are a really big part to, to complement, they're making these structures look like they belong. And I think that's really important from all sides to get everyone to come together and to, to meet to make the progress happen. Okay. So, um, how have the, the new zoning codes affected Long Island in, in a positive way? Maybe, maybe you can give us some examples uh, of how it has. Because I know your firm has worked on several projects uh, that have been subject to these, these newer codes, incorporating smart growth, TOD, walkable places. Well, I don't think any of this could have been done uh, the new type of projects that we're seeing through a variance process, almost all of them have been done with uh, overlay districts or uh, a, a complete new zone developed. Uh, we worked in, in Wyandanche. Uh, it was a, we weren't there the whole time, but we were there for the master developer RFP, uh, and we did the first two buildings there, and that was all part of a, a rezoning of the whole train station. In Wyandanche, uh, we also worked in Copeg, uh, where they did a downtown uh, development district, allowing for, for greater height and density. Um, currently, we're working with Marwa and VHB in the, in the village of Westbury, uh, rezoning uh, Post Avenue and also uh, the Maple Union Triangle, and. The only way that this all can be done is by streamlining the approval process, which which takes a lot of time. There's a whole secret process, a series of events have to occur, and, and you know I'm I'm just an architect, but every single one of these processes takes takes time, and, and that's why I don't know that it's resistance as much as just the amount of time it takes to get it through all the processes. Uh, for the most part, we've seen acceptance of uh, greater density, uh, three, four, five-story buildings. I think we have some slides. Do you have yeah. Sal's presentation on them, Moa? Maybe you want to yeah, I could, show uh, some examples. Yeah, I could quickly... Uh, yeah, we load it. The power of the power That's right. <laughs> Just tell me when you want me to switch. Or you can go to the first one is... Uh, is Wine Inch. Uh, Great logo. Does it look good, right? <laughs> we'll start with the square. <laughs> there we go. All right. Sorry, oh, not my laptop. <laughs> um, I didn't sign up for this part. <laughs> She's a volunteer. <laughs> so you see, on the left is the uh, the original uh, plan, which which made the zoning work, and that was done. Uh, before we got involved, and when the developers, when Al Albany's organization got involved, we worked with them to refine what you see in the center of the square, which was the first two buildings, 177 units. Uh, we extended one building over, we, we moved the parking garage, literally. We put the wrap building at the top, which hopefully would just uh, start in 2019. And, uh, you know, currently, if you go to the next slide, you can see uh, well, there's that, that central plaza, uh, and those two buildings on either side are now built. You can go to the next slide. Uh, five stories, uh, that's a 91-unit building, 40-station drive, a mixture of architecture, uh, Tudor, uh, Georgian, all, all different styles, broken down as they, as they move across the facade. You go to the next one, you also see the ice skating rink there, and this is Ten <coughs> Station Drive, which is three stories above retail, and that kind of frames the park in the center. Uh, if you go to the next slide, 
Uh, this is Copeg, where we worked with the town of Babylon. And Copeg had the idea that right by the train station, they wanted to promote density. And if you're within a certain distance of the train station, you can build taller and greater density. And that particular site is literally right next to the train station. And now complete is, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, some of our initial designs working with the, the town of uh, Babylon. It's a two building complex that was proposed, 45 units on either side, four stories, and you go to the next slide. And it's actually constructed now. It's completely uh, leased up. Uh, next slide is, um, this is Lindenhurst, where we work with the developer and the village to come up with a new overlay district again a downtown development district promoting density. Uh, VHB also was a part of this project. And this is a 260 unit multifamily development. And you can see on the next slide. Uh, the working drawings are gonna be done next week and this should hopefully will start construction. It's a mixture of three, four stories. Uh, there's a creek that runs through the property with, with units on either side and a central courtyard. And the next slide, this is in the village of Port Jefferson. This happens to be in a uh, walkable downtown already. It's three stories. And the unusual thing here was the existing zoning. Uh, it, was, it was probably never thought that people would build an apartment building here, but the exi existing zoning allowed it and uh, the density, the, the FIR all fit in and one of the things that helped it to fit in is that landscape deck on the top. There's 168 cars parked underneath, 112 units and a, a bridge leading across the way to the other side of the property for, for guest parking. But that's uh, finished now. And then the last slide is, uh, oh, okay, there's one, there's one more. Uh, the village of Hempstead, Hempstead Village <coughs> Uh, that was a, pr a project uh, that we recently got involved in is uh, Carmen Place on the corner of Maine and Bedell. If you go to the next slide, uh, we've just finished the working drawings on this as well. This is 226 units on either side of the block on the side. Of, the one side is Main Street. Again, it's walkable to the train station, but the only way it could be done was to rezone uh, and put an overlay actually was an overlay district was created there it wasn't a rezone and the final one is uh, Westbury where we're looking at different zoning districts applying different heights and densities as you get to the train station and really making for a more walkable community so in these communities you found acceptance obviously um, of these proposals um, from the, the folks that, that, that live in the area right but it's taken a long time, uh, as we were talking about inside earlier. I mean, it's two, three years. Uh, it's a long haul, <laughs> but it seems like we've gotten there. Uh, you got to be patient. Yeah. So in in Baldwin, it, I think the re the acceptance of additional density um, in communities like Baldwin was there. But when you start talking about making it more walkable mm -hmm. and the implications of what's going to happen in order for it to be more walkable. So for example, the road, the words road diet usually scare people because that automatically, people think traffic and I'm not gonna have as many lanes to drive my car, but they don't really understand that we're trying to make it safer for pedestrians to walk with these road diets and, and trying to force cars to slow down so that it is does have that more of a downtown feel and it's not really a road diet as much as it changing the configuration of lanes and sidewalks so that people can ride bikes and walk and it can be a shared space in the community. Let's let's stick with that. Mm -hmm. Let's stick with I'm not gonna, not gonna ignore, you, ignore you guys, don't worry. But let's stick with that because I know you have some slides uh, with regard to um, walkability yeah. um, and complete streets. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that a little bit um, in terms of um, you know what a properly defined uh, design complete streets look like. Um, I, I think we are, I think everybody in the room understands what it is, but why don't you explain it? Um, and then also how does zoning impact the the development or enhancement of walkability? And Sal touched on that a bit. So complete streets, it, it's, I guess it's a 
fairly new concept that we've been hearing about of late of the last few years, but it promotes, you know, safety, it promotes economic development. It's really looking to create a sense of community, to um, provide local businesses with that foot traffic that you no longer really find in the smaller downtowns because people are getting in their cars and driving to these larger um, strip malls or, or malls or whatever. Um, so it's really a way to encourage walking and to encourage pedestrian traffic that's a safer environment for people. So we, we definitely looked at um, trying to bring these concepts into the Grand Avenue corridor. And Grand Avenue is tough because Grand <laughs> Avenue is um, a Nassau County road and there is um, truck traffic that goes down this road. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a little hard to incorporate mm -hmm. these elements into a road like that. It's not a village road, but, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> That's I'm a double blinding. Okay. It's not showing up on my screen here, so I don't know. Okay, here we go. So it re we looked at different design aspects and, and to just improve circulation. But some of the things that we looked at um, in terms of complete streets was the changing of lane striping. So the road diet, although it's been presented as a reduction in lanes, it really is just a lane striping. And it's the cha changing of the lane striping so that it can accommodate bicyclists, it can accommodate pedestrians. Some of the other concepts that we looked at in terms of design improvements to make these, um, to make the Grand Avenue corridor more walkable was um, street trees and green infrastructure, um, uh, signage, permeable pavers, uh, uh, sidewalks and crosswalks. So all these concepts really incorporate complete streets to make it safer, to make it um, look better so that it's more appealable to the eye and people would want to walk down the street. Um, I have just some examples um, as to what these concepts, so, th so for example, stormwater trees and planter boxes. I mean, you automatically think of green infrastructure as just like stormwater recharge and stuff like that. But really adding these types of elements to complete street design enhance walkability, it makes people want to walk more, and it also reduces traffic. It's been known to reduce traffic. Some other concepts are permeable pavers. So these aesthetic elements not only provide the necessary infrastructure needs that we, we need in these corridors, but it also just helps with the walkability and traffic safety. Um, signage, green gutters, these are all elements that are incorporated into complete streets design in addition to the lane restriping sidewalks and um, road diet stuff. Okay. I think I mean I think I can add a little bit to uh, talking about that. Um, a lot of the images you showed. You can go back like three or four slides to um, kind of the ones with the uh, sidewalks in the corner and then this, uh, that one. Mm -hmm. um, as an architect, I mean this this conversation doesn't really stop here. Um, I wanted to talk today a lot about um, kind of working together with engineers and, mm -hmm. and and how we can we have to really design together. Um, if it if it stops there and, and at the, the building frontage, it's not this isn't thought about cohesively. You're not going to have the same kind of effect that if you step the building back a little bit further, you can have a wider sidewalk. You have the opportunity for things like street cafes, and you can really bring that that public space further into into the architecture as well. I mean, galleries, arcades, uh, things like that can be added I mean, in certain instances. And then um, awnings. I mean, uh, awnings also add um, a little bit of interest to the to the facade of the buildings. And brings brings the elevation out to the street a little bit more. Gives places a piece, uh, people a place to stand. Um, like wait for, wait for their friend, uh, make a phone call. It really brings more um, activity to the street, which it all adds to making places more walkable. Um, also, having having more people on the street means usually streets are safer. There's more people out there to watch what's going on, and and that's these are kind of all the design questions we have to answer, and and the elements we have to think about adding to make places more walkable altogether. You had some experience, I want to stick with this for a minute, you've had some experience in the village of Roslyn, correct? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of integrating um, residential with near to the commercial area. Well, um, in Roslyn we, we have a tough time with um, the historic district board and the, and the zoning there. Um, what we're really trying to do is make make all everybody accept that there, there is a mix there and it's a, it's a great mix there are some 
there are some apartments actually on um, Roslyn Road, and and working those in has been has been difficult to, to get to approvals, but it, um, it it works, and and there are people walking to the restaurants, um, parking obviously in Roslyn is an issue with all, all the restaurants at night, and then also the uh, the developments on Lumber Road and everything, um, that's that's going to be a, a tough thing to deal with the, the parking once all those fill up, and and I think it's important to think about all these the maybe adding street elements to accommodate all the pedestrians and, and things like that. Will you be adding new new residential homes mm -hmm. outside of the commercial area? That as well, yeah. Okay, single family homes, I assume? Single family homes. Yeah, because it's Roslyn Village. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you want to add anything, Chuck? Just anybody can jump in. I mean, it's kind of supposed to be a, kind of a freewheeling uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, otherwise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just move a little bit. Um, we can always come back to this, to um, housing. Um, we, we all know, you know, what the situation is on the island with housing. I mean, I've got a 23-year-old uh, daughter who lives at home. Um, <laughs> Where was he? I don't think she'll ever leave. <laughs> I, I don't think she'll ever leave. Yeah, I don't think she'll ever leave. I couldn't throw her out. In hey, event. the fiance is next. <laughs> And the cat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in any event, um, what are we doing? Are we doing enough? What more can we do? Next gen housing? You know, what's the wave of the future? Um, again, the, the issue of resistance. Um, I live in Huntington. Okay, I live in Melbourne. And there's always been, and I love the town of Huntington, but there's always been resistance in Huntington. Apartments, always. I mean, it, unlike some other um, uh, areas uh, where they've kind of taken the bull by the horn you know, in the downtown areas and built, um, uh, you know, four or five, four or five story uh, apartments, um, allocating some apartments, you know, for um, for millennials and the like. But what have we done? What more do we need to do? How do we do it? Is it a political resistance? It's always partially political. But how do we how do we how do we get these they're gonna be in the form of coded names. Right? These um, overlay districts, they really help um, foster that kind of development, but without community acceptance, it's a little hard to get these. What kind of housing are we talking about? We're we talking about Apartment buildings. Um, it would be multifamily, a mix of residential type townhomes, apartments, um, you know, affordable workforce, senior. It, it, it's, it's a mix. We're, we're promoting in these overlay districts a mix of zoning to really um, to, to tailor it to the needs of, of the entire population, not just the typical single family residential population, because there is a greater need. And I think fostering these types of zoning codes near the train station is easier. Like why in there? Like Wyandanche, like Baldwin, like Baldwin. Patchogue, okay. like, you know, we could go down the list, Huntington. Having the train station is such a huge asset, um, and it really helps um, make the zone, rezoning process, these Westbury, a lot easier, I think, and, and it allows the community to understand it better. And plus it allows millennials and younger folks who do need to commute back and forth to work, if they... It makes it easier for them to want to come to Long Island to live because they, they don't feel like they need to rely on a car. We, we actually now have that zoning in place in a lot of these locations that we talked about. And the reason I think also is, is because some of those buildings and places were underutilized, whether it was a parking lot or an industrial building, uh, maybe it's environmentally challenged, but a lot of the buildings that we've <coughs> knocked down were you know, old warehouses, uh, Lindenhurst, Copeg, that were probably not in the right spot. They were they were there because people didn't want them anywhere other than that place by the train station that was not that important anymore. But if the train station becomes more and more important, that property becomes more and more valuable, and that's where hopefully <coughs> we'll see these multifamily developments, which will help the retail in turn and, you know, make more of a sustainable downtown, whether it's also in, you know, places like Bayshore, 
that were talked about earlier today. You know, Hunt Huntington as well. Um, all these places need street life, and it comes with apartments, and that helps the retail. What about um, micro apartments? Mm -hmm. Is that is that something? There are there are some on Long Island, are there not? Mm -hmm. um, and is that something that's a wave of the future, especially in the case of millennials? I guess. Um, what's everybody's thoughts on that? Um, as a millennial, I'm not a big fan of the micro apartment, <laughs> but I have a lot of friends that are. Um, you know, it, it's it's a couple of things, and I guess like I said, this as a millennial, um, saving for a house is hard. You know, and um, you know you need that down payment. How the single family homes on Long Island are not cheap, um, and a lot of the ones that are for sale need work, and a lot of money has to go into fixing up a house that you would buy, and. The, the generation of millennials, you know, our lifestyle is different where we work hard and, um, you know, we, we don't necessarily want to have to do that. And so these multifamily, these micro apartments serve a purpose, maybe a temporary purpose, purpose to get to kickstart a career and then turn into or move into a different type of larger multifamily or maybe eventually a single family home. But um, the micro apartments, um, are popping up more and more and I have plenty of friends that live in the city that, and their whole apartment's only like 300 square feet. It, it, they're tiny and they absolutely love it. <laughs> so uh, I think um, Long Island should embrace it but I, I think uh, in, in, in a broader scope um, these other type of multifamily or mixed uses will be I think better for communities um, that may have some resistance to that type of uh, development. Okay, we shift a little bit. Ma, what's a question for you, but if anybody can chime in. Form-based zoning, mm -hmm. right? So how does that play into smart growth? I mean, it kind of gives a, a real paradigm, it gives an outline, and kind of sets, sets you in place in terms of, you know, what can go there. What's your experience with that? you know, in terms of fostering smart growth. I just, just by way of background, um, I was part of the team, I think it selected and didn't go anywhere, um, that worked on a form-based code for around the airport area in Babylon, right? Um, unfortunately, I don't think that project progressed, but it was, it was very interesting. But I'd like to, as a planner, yeah. what your thoughts are? I'm, I'm noticing that form-based codes are not as popular as they used to be. And I think because? it's because there isn't as much flexibility. You know, providing the overlay district by allowing, and there's less resistance with an overlay district because you're allowing the community and the municipality to keep their underlying zoning. So if there isn't this full force, full nature of just putting this new zoning in place. So You're not abandoning one exactly. zoning district in favor of the other. Exactly. So you know, the form-based code, I think, at some point worked for certain communities, depending on the extent of what was happening. However, the overlay district, using that concept rather than a form-based code, allows for flexibility, allows for it to happen in a, in a natural manner, where it's not, you know, you know, if, if someone wants to sell their property for it to be redeveloped under the overlay district code it can it can happen it doesn't it doesn't need to happen but it could happen and it's there so there's no there's no force to, to and there's no real there's the guidelines there's design guidelines that are part of it of the overlay district so there's the form based code just makes it really I think um, concrete and have it you seen any on Long Island um, where, there, there where are you're, you're nodding your head well, Wine Dance has a yeah. form based that, code. That's one based code? Okay. And Hempstead Village does, and Riverside in Southampton. Uh, but the Wine Dance one is for that small, really just that small area by the train station, right? Yeah, well, I, th I think it's well, like extends I think it's like further 40 down. acres. Yeah. But yes, but that has a form based code which dictates uh, street frontages. It's really a different way of having a zone other than a Euclidean zone. It also requires certain architectural uh, standards uh, than, uh, than the Euclidean code could have, but maybe it, maybe it also could have those same standards. I mean, we talked about this 
uh, in a recent project, and they were not in favor of a, uh, a form-based code. And I think for the, some of the reasons that Marwa was talking about, it might place uh, some rigidity on existing landowners, and those are your, your key stakeholders. So you, they want the freedom maybe to do what they want with their property. Uh, you know, and the form-based code really puts a strict standard on development. And I suspect that may have been, there were probably political forces at work, but I, I suspect that that may have been one of the reasons why, I think it's Airport Plaza, um, that's on 110, um, the movie theaters there. You're talking about the East Farmingdale yeah. form-based code. Yeah. Were you working on that? No, but I saw it. Uh, it was very ambitious. It was very ambitious, yeah. and probably because it was that ambitious, is probably why that resistance and uh, it really didn't really didn't get off the ground. Okay. Um, just to add, uh, please. Um, Form-based codes. I mean, you, your question was really, do, do you see it being kind of a solution? Um, uh, the same way that Euclidean codes restrict you from doing things uh, by saying that you can't do them. Um, Form-based codes say that you must do certain things. So it's equally as restrictive in the opposite direction. Um, I think um, kind of the overlay districts really give you an opportunity to present something that <coughs> might be the answer that might not fit into either the, the Euclidean codes or the, or the form-based codes. It's really a site specific, it gives you more opportunity to do a site-specific solution. Mm -hmm. And and having those restrictions, somebody has to set those restrictions from the beginning and nobody knows what they are yet. So every project is, is unique and has, has unique solutions that maybe don't fall in either one. So I think really there's a middle ground that, that has to, that, like I said, each. All these projects are not just being approved as of right for the most part. Um, they're they're all exceptions to the, the laws and the codes. That's true. And you know what? My experience is that, for instance, if we're if we're going for a change of zone, you're you're presenting a site plan, regardless of the, whether it's smart growth or not. You're providing a site plan that you really can't vary too much from to begin with, because that's what that's what the town board or the village board has approved. So, do you really need a you know, form-based code um, in order to accomplish the same thing. Do you agree with that? Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I got blanked out for a second. Do I agree with? No, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Just to go back to the, every project being site-specific. I mean, e every project is going to have all the, all the board hearings and all, all the meetings that everybody's going to have an input. And even, even the form-based codes might suggest something. Um, the boards are going to have a different opinion, and they're going to shape your project in different ways. They always do. So. That, that's just another point in why, why each project really has its own, it's, especially here where everything's so different. And it's, not, it's not what people thought was going to be in, in, these, in these spaces, in these zones. It's a different use every time. And we're proposing different uses in, in, in uh, places where they were warehouses, like you were talking about. Um, and now they're, now they're going to be mixed-use multifamily houses. So the, the code is kind of, it, you, can't, you can't really think about the code. You have to think about what do people want. and and how do you solve that problem? And each and each side's gonna be different. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we, we've had we've had a good number of years of experience with the smart growth development. Um, where where do we go from here? What what do we need to to do to further um, walkable communities, TOD, smart growth in general? Outreach, I think. Yeah. We need to get <laughs> communities involved. You know, they, they need their opinions. We need them to get. If you have the community support, it, it will be that much easier to get things done. I think um, community outreach was such a huge component of the Baldwin um, corridor study that we worked on. We did. Um, we were at community events. We did large workshops in the community, and it was it was important for us to understand what they wanted and what they didn't want. You know, was, we gave them examples of, of different types of housing, we gave them examples of restaurants, we gave them examples of all different types of facade improvements, and they literally went with like dots and said yes or no as to what they wanted to see. And it was an easy way to Charette's create charrette type work, work sessions, and it was an easy way to really get their buy-in yeah. into what was the final recommendations within the plan. So getting that community buy-in from the start and really understanding what a community will tolerate for the most part um, is so important before even going on to the next steps. 
I just want to add to that real quick. So another thing that I've noticed is when you do the public uh, community outreach, um, you, you adapt the information, but what, what a big problem is at the public hearings, those are, that are in support are often not the ones that show up to these hearings. That's right. It's the opposite. Yes. It's those that were not at the, the workshops or the, the greets that show up at the, uh, the hearings and voicing their opinions. Now those opinions now of record for the board and it, it, it puts a damper on the progress that was made behind the scenes. And I think that's something that if those issues could be curtailed would be beneficial and help move things along quicker. <laughs> It is, you're 100% correct. Right. It's always it's very difficult to get people who support a project to come out. I remember when my law firm uh, did the Greens in, in Melville, or Dix Hills, whatever, depending upon how you view it. Uh, I remember um, actually bust people in. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no. This, this is a project that the community basically wanted. I mean, the Greens is a very popular, you know where that is. Yeah. Um, it's a very popular uh, place to live. Um, and it was, uh, I think we actually created the, um, uh, the code. It was an overlay district. It's basically an overlay district. And um, I remember the night of the hearing, there were buses in the, in the parking lot um, at Huntington Town Hall. Um, and uh, there was a waiting list to buy, to buy homes. That, so it's, it, it, was, it was a popular project. Um, didn't have the same type of forces against it um, as, as some of these other projects do. I think it took 20 years to build the affordable component of that <laughs> town of Huntington <laughs> resisted it. <laughs> I'm not sure it was the town. Yeah, it was somebody. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It was. But it was ultimately built as a um, as a kind of a hybrid co-op. Um, along with, I, I live off the back of Telegraph, right. so I, I pass it all the time. It was, it was uh, I think they call it a something equity co-op, um, right. where you do get co-op ownership, but there are a lot of restrictions. Um, but it was, it was the affordable, the affordable component um, uh, of, of the Greens project. Right. Which was very successful. Right. Well, I was going to say that a big thing that would help is improving the Long Island Railroad, but uh, it would make all of these places more desirable. And if you really wanted to go, and, and Penn Station, all the, you know, that back and forth would be a lot more pleasant. And uh, <coughs> being by the train station, a walkable community, even that much more better. That was part of the um, proposal in funding, was to reopen the train station. Oh, right, at uh, Highmore. At but, right, to open the train, train station. Um, but unfortunately, since that proposal didn't go forward, um, I, don't, I don't think that train station uh, uh, is open. Let me ask you, does anybody have any questions before we go any further? Good. Yell your hand went up first. I have a lot of questions, but... Go ahead. But mostly concerning the overlay districts, you mentioned the project that, that you instigated the, the overlay district, and I also had a project that instigated an overlay district. Now, these overlay districts, do they come from both directions? Do the municipalities create these in, as in, uh, in response to someone coming and saying, gee, I'd like to develop this property, but the zoning doesn't work, can we create an overlay district? Or is the municipality taking the, the initiative to create these districts and to create the initiative for someone to come and develop? Or is it both? It's both. It's definitely both. It depends on the community. It depends on the situation. Um, I can tell you about a community that probably has a lot of, that does have a lot of proposals before them and would like to create an overlay district to accommodate these proposals. And then there are communities that are just in great despair and their economics are failing and, you know, people are getting um, priced out of their homes and it's just not uh, a thriving community. And so. The um, municipality looks to create an overlay district to help spur economic development. So, on a, on a developer type of request, mm -hmm. how does the overlay district make it easier than changing the zone? It um, streamlines the process because what we'll do with an overlay district is we'll do the secret up front. So, 
typically a developer won't need to come in now at this point and have to go through the entire secret process, which most of us know can be timely and costly. You're saying on a developer side? Well, that's what we're saving the developer the time and the cost of doing secret because the overlay district is in place. So, and as long as they come in and they're building in line with whatever is um, outlined under the overlay district, secret is already done for them. And that's the municipality side. No, that's the developer side. Really? Yeah. Because the municipality is incurring the cost of the CPRA on the overlay district. So if the developer was going the change of zone route, that whole secret process would happen at that time versus where she's saying it's already done for the most part. And just for that site. Correct. Well, yeah. well the overlay the district yeah, would so typically so encompass no, a local. What I was saying, right. yes. Yeah. So right. It's, it's very isolated. You'd be doing the process a zillion times. Exactly. Correct. So. Let's back up. Take overlay district, rezoning, and uh, ZBA, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Explain the difference between each of those processes. They all involve secret, right? Yes. Yes. So other than that, so you're doing an overlay zone with specific uh, standards that right. want to be put in place. And it builds that gets done when there's rezoning as well, right? And right. like Sal said, that can have guidelines and all kinds of things. Right. Bigger process, bigger planning, bigger view. You're saying overlay district for one project? No, I'm no. saying overlay district for a larger area. A larger area, yeah, okay. Absolutely, that but, would come but why are you saying it's for the developer? I'm sorry? What, you said it's, it, well, it's, it's helping for the, the developer. It's for the Save benefit time. of the developer. So, for example, um, unfortunately, I don't yeah. have Maybe an outline. multiple developers, maybe that makes it. No, I get, I get that. So you're saying it's an overlay district, which right. implies it's a bigger area. Absolutely. And so you want to have certain standards met there or be able to do things beyond what the current zone is. Absolutely. How is that, why legally is that easier than okay. rezoning or going through a PDD or... Okay, but let's, so there's no confusion. District doesn't mean it has to be a huge no, area. Yeah. Because we, we have zoning district, you know. Yeah, parking district, everything. Well, but we have, you know, in Huntington, you know, you've got different districts, right? You know, you business mean, you district mean representative wise or no just in terms of we're not talking about geographic wise we're just talking about the the, the, the type of district okay okay so um, which could occur in any number of places that's correct so the difference is what do you guys can go through the process if you want of ZBA versus town board um, John if you want well it's up to you ZBA. I'm just curious on how an overlay district supersedes all of these other okay factors. so what it does usually the overlay district regulations <laughs> indicate where where that overlay district can be placed. Okay, clearly you can't place it in a in an R in Huntington. One acre is R forty. You, you typically wouldn't be able to place it, you know, in the middle of a of a residential area if it was a commercial overlay district. Okay, it, it usually the overlay regulations tells you where where it can be placed, and I think what Mawa was saying is that the benefit of an overlay district is that it's been created, okay? Is it necessarily been placed anywhere, but it's been created with certain uh, parameters. With parameters on where it can be placed, so to speak. Okay? And you have to do to meet it. Correct. So that when a developer comes in and has a piece of property and, and they want to, uh, I'll, I'll say rezone it, but put the overlay district on it the sequence already been done on so if they meet the, that the impacts, was, the they impacts that of that district, yeah. okay. so that there's less involved from the developer's side because, as the panel said, the work is already done. Now, does that mean there isn't going to be resistance? Absolutely not. You, you, you'll meet the same resistance. It doesn't matter whether it's an overlay or whether it's a change of zone, or whether it's a ZBA. Planning board's not so much because usually those are permitted uses, typically. Can't be special permits. Um, but you'll, you'll meet less, you could meet resistance, but the process is shorter. Well, it's easier for you to say I'm as of right. Mm -hmm. Court, right? Exactly. So. Exactly. exactly. So can an overlay district more nebulous than that can it can stay if you have like a C six zone right 
and you say, in certain circumstances of a certain size property, or this, you can you can develop it as a C1 or something, or some other type of it, without it being in a, like the Huntington created the Huntington Station overnight, right. which is basically in you know, the C6 zone, and it, it's almost a form-based uh, zone. It says you can do this, you can do this, and you can't put the laundromats there. Or there. But is it, is it something that can be designed that isn't around gate and area? Okay. We're doing something that's, that is a, it's, it's zone C6 currently. Zone, zone, okay. zone. That would kind of be where these zoning, uh, these floating zones pop up, but even that, even those will have a pretty strict set of criteria that you would need to meet. So for example, town of Hampstead has the CAS zone, which is a floating zone, but in order to meet it, you need to be, uh, and the whole intent is to promote transit-oriented developments, and it needs to be adjacent to a railroad station or within 200 feet of the railroad next to it. You need to be a certain distance away from residential. So there's another set of criteria that you still need to meet in order to have the change of zone. But see, that is, just to get back to the overlay, that's a change of zone from one zone to this floating zone. The overlay district sits on top of an existing zone. And if you fit within that criteria of the overlay district zoning, you have an as of right to utilize that benefit. So that's kind of the difference. But you don't have to meet both, right? You, if you the meet underlying the overlay, zoning and yeah, the overlay yeah. district now. Right. So whether that's compatible physically or not, right. But you're typically going, tell me if I'm wrong, guys, you're typically going to the town board to have that done because that's the only board that's empowered to do that. Right. Always over there. We'll, we'll work our way back. Uh, yes, the town of Royce de Bay, I, I, I've been involved with that downtown history being revitalization. And the downtown area right, has been zoned with the CB5, commercial business, five stories. And the town is in the process, you know, we convinced the town that you, I don't know if it's best to change the zoning based on what I'm hearing or you go to an overlay. But the town is right now in the process of doing the documentation for the changing the zone to one to uh, keep commercial business but at a lower level with four stories and a transit oriented development district at uh, you know three to four stories. It would be best for them to do a complete zone change or do an overlay. What is what is your case on this? It's gonna be a case by case basis and uh, it depends on what's going to work best for the, for the for the area. An overlay district might work. Um, a floating district, um, zoning district might work as well, where criteria needs to be met. Um, from what I'm hearing, I actually think the overlay may work pretty good. They have pretty sound boundaries that we design downtown area. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you could use those boundaries as as your boundaries for the overlay. Yes, we're going to work our way down. Good morning. Good morning. My question goes back to uh, the discussion about micro apartments. Um, if someone could um, say if they're aware of, of locations on Long Island that are successfully uh, utilizing micro apartments, and also if um, a lot of the conversation we've heard has been about the, the use as a housing solution for millennials, but what about um, people who are transitioning, going through some kind of life transition, or maybe even seniors that are downsizing? Are you hearing any discussion about um, it being utilized as another housing solution outside just millennial housing? Panel. I don't know of any specific places that have the uh, micro apartments. Okay. I mean, I haven't really, I'm not in the market for one, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't you know, know if you don't like it. Uh, <laughs> finance. Uh, the, uh, this morning, the town of Hempstead supervisor was talking about that there was a backlash against millennial, millennial housing, and then she, def I didn't know why there would be, but mm. she defined it as, you know, four or five people sharing a, a kitchen and a bathroom, and then I understood why they. I heard that. that. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. I mean, to me, a millennial housing would be like a, a nice studio, and you could have maybe smaller appliances, or you know, or maybe you know, it's a second home for somebody. We're also but hearing I didn't a lot, understand. and it's it's actually less expensive for developers, from what I understand, to build rather than building studios to build apartments that are two bedrooms, two bathrooms, so that people could be roommates and still have separate bathrooms. So right. Because it's just obviously cheaper to build one kitchen one rather kitchen. than two kitchens. Sure. So um, that's becoming, I think, a popular way to um, 
fulfill that need for millennials so that they can actually share the rent and, and still have some separation in terms of space. Um, and it's more economical for the developer and enticing for the developer, developer to build those kinds of units. Um, in terms of micro units, I don't personally know of any on Long Island. I don't know if anybody else in the room does, but I know that it's been talked about by developers. Um, I just don't know of any that have actually been built on Long Island. To Keith, Keith, I, I think you were asking, you know, about the transitional situation. Yeah. I read an article a couple months ago about what they're doing in Chicago. Or they're, 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 you know, it was a plan to afford by the mayor or something. Had some park areas available, park space, <clears throat> and they were looking at like constructing you know, the tiny houses. Tiny houses, right? You know, and uh, as a way to address a lot of their homeless situation and stuff like that. And uh, I, I know I, it must have been online or something. I, must, I, I remember texting back, or I never heard back. But, you know, one of the things they have to consider when you do something like that are all the other services and infrastructure. Of course, that's needed to make that person's life livable, right? So things like a place to sit outside in the shade. And that. If you're going to be in a tiny space, you, your outside is real important. Right. So that's that's kind of like with micro stuff. What you said, like uh, your friend has an apartment 300 yeah. square feet, but he walks out and he's <laughs> on Brian Park or something. Right. You know, so what's his life about? Yeah, he's there to sleep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, by the way, I, wasn't, I know your question was broader you know, in terms of that, the overall housing needs on, on Long Island, which I think we all recognize and accept, you know, and in terms of, do, do you have a specific focus, though, or is it just a general question? Um, no, I was just curious if uh, some of the discussion about the smaller housing units extended beyond millennials to uh, being a solution for other types of needs uh, mm -hmm. beyond just millennial housing. So people who are in transition, maybe you know you're coming in for a cons you know some kind of job that's going to be of a short-term duration, and you don't want to buy a house, you don't want to rent an, an apartment long term. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe even seniors. Um, obviously, you know, micro apartments are so small that might not be the ideal long-term solution for seniors. But just I just wondered if there was another broader discussion about using some of those smaller housing uh, spaces as, for others besides just millennials. Okay. Thank you. I think um, just to just to touch on it from a, a young person's perspective, um, <laughs> millennials aren't aliens. We don't have like this specific type <laughs> of housing. Well, it on <laughs> <laughs> um, we, Careful. We, we, I'm on the cusp. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, we're really talking about affordable housing that is just attainable. I mean, it's not attainable for young people, <coughs> the people in my position, to put a down payment down on a house. We just want something smaller. We don't want we don't want this foreign idea that this new typology of a micro apartment. We just want a smaller apartment that we can afford. Right? <laughs> just to, no, you clear. want anything you can afford. Exactly. Right. That's, so that's and, a so I think place to live. And uh, my big question on that, and I've been coming to these things, Keith, you know, for 30 years, and we, you know, my biggest question is always, it's always project specific. At least today, with there were more projects, and maybe that's a function of the success of the whole effort. But my question's always been: like you talk about resistance, there's people that have been living here for a long time that way, and they came here for a reason. Now we all know better because we're all educated, right? So, okay. So my question is to all the designers: Where do you live? I live in a condo, so I'm covered. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask that. I mean, you know, five five acres in Manhasset. You know, I mean, I, you know, I grew up in Fort Washington. I lived on Long Island my whole life. I had to move out of Long Island because I had to get out of right. my parents' house. Yeah. Um, I, I I moved into the city and I commute back to Roslyn every day. So it, it's it's crazy. To so me you that can I, afford that? I, I I have a I have a girlfriend who I split a studio apartment with. I'm not I'm not doing it on my own. I don't own I don't own an apartment. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm 30 years old. I, yeah. I, I wish I did. Um, so it's, again, it's so, so that was a great question uh, back there. I, I just think it's really about creating affordable housing for anybody who needs yeah, it. Yeah, we got to be careful with the labels. You're right. You're right. Yes. Uh, with the Hun Huntington Housing Coalition, I think there's a real disconnect a lot of times when you hear what kind of what he just described about the way the younger people actually live and what the developers and builders think they need. When you know politicians in particular, particularly when you're talking to school boards. 
think, oh, a younger person may want a, a one-room apartment. What they really want is affordability. And a lot of times what brings that affordability are two and three bedroom apartments, specifically <coughs> so they can live and share the rent. You know, a, a, you know, in the station and the Renaissance thing, we're put, they're putting in one bedroom, but they're $2,200, $2,300. That's, that's yeah. not going to be affordable for most <laughs> of the people if they live one person to the one bedroom. And uh, I'm curious as whether other people are seeing that kind of disconnect between the, the people who do the planning and the politicians versus the actual demand. I think that's yeah, they've been creeping up. I think that's uh, right, 100% accurate. Uh, you know, it, it, affordability is the driving force to a lot of this, and you know, it, it's not about structuring or designing necessarily. I mean, yeah, you want to fit the the clientele, but at the end of the day, dollars <laughs> is where it always has been and will be forever. You know, I mean, and that doesn't just go for millennials. I mean. Um, empty nesters that are trying to downsize. I mean, it, it, it goes both ways. I mean, these transit-oriented developments are not millennial-specific. They're, you know, they're for individuals. Just so happens to be that I guess we have a louder voice, the millennial as a as a group. But there are plenty of uh, um, empty nesters that their kids finally left, <laughs> and now they're ready to do away with the extra maintenance of paying a landscaper and the higher electric bill and are ready to kind of bring it down. Kids will come to me, you know, or I'll go to the kids. It's a, it's a different aspect of life and I think we're finally starting to grasp it. I mean, we've all been in that situation where we're creative about our living, right? When we were in school, we had roommates and apartments. And so now that's kind of extended out beyond your education. Right. There's a need. We need employees, we need to produce, so people need a place to live. I think we got to be careful we don't design it so tight that you guys can't be creative about how you use it. Correct. I think the reality is that a lot of these downtowns that are being successful, you're creating these, these areas that create demand. And I think because we're under-centered in our downtowns, because we have a lot of these places that um, are trying to become those new regional centers. It's, it's basically initiatives of the municipality that create an environment for a developer to want to come in because at the end of the day it's all about making money for a developer. So for a developer to come in and you create an overlay district, you do a street diet, you create all these things that make it so that they can put a project that's going to put money in their, pro in their pocket, you run into a lot of other problems that make it difficult, i.e. a lot of our downtowns are on these state roads. How do you find the ability to create these bowl bounds, these uh, walkable downtowns, these, these things that make it desirous for a younger generation to want to live in the downtown when you have an organization like the DOT, which principally just wants to move traffic? It's not easy. Uh, <laughs> it's really passionate. Yeah, she is very passionate. She's so passionate out there. Talk about recycling and wastewater management. It's so hard to focus. <laughs> The DOT is actually getting better. If you if you can start talking to them I early enough. I was going to say, we, um, for example, Baldwin is a great example only because Grand Avenue Corridor is a Nassau County road. We've got Town of Hempstead as the um, person, the, the entity that's, you know, taking care of the zoning, and then you've got uh, Sunrise Highway. That's a DOT yeah. road. So coordination is key with this project and working together from the very start and understanding the, and having that dialogue with DOT, the Long Island Railroad, Nassau County, Town of Hempstead, and all these um, entities working together, it's probably one of the first projects I've seen that there's actually been coordination between all these entities from the very beginning. And there's buy-in. They, they want to see it succeed, so DOT will work to make sure that the proper mitigation measures are put in place so that, you know, whether it's signal um, changes in timing so that people can cross the street. Um, you know, Nassau County is working on the road diet and moving forward with the design on making it a more walkable Grand Avenue corridor. And the town of Hempstead is implementing the overlay district. It's really an intermunicipal um, exchange and coordination to make this area really work well. And to go to just 
take a step back, you know, in addition to doing all this, we've been actually meeting with developers to understand the economics from their perspective, because we already know what the community wants. We just want to make sure that this works for developers, too, because who's really going to build this at the end of the day, right? It's the developers. So we've met with a series of different developers, a couple of them are in the room today, and to really understand what their clientele is, what their needs are, and how the overlay district can be implemented in a way that will meet their needs as well as the community's needs. So it's really communicate communication is key to really make the, making these kinds of projects succeed. Does that Boulder project have a state road? Uh, yeah. Sunrise, Sunrise Highway. Highway. And Sunrise Highway, so are there initiatives that are affecting that road that DOT is spending on or well we're working with DOT currently because eventually the secret is going to determine that we're going to need obviously some signal cha time changing and things like that to help make the road a little bit more easier to walk across and cross the street to get to the train station. I think we have time for one more question because time's running out. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Two more questions then. Okay. okay. All right. Thank I'll, you. I'll go fast. So we've been talking a lot about trying to get these projects done. Right, reaching out to the community, people being resistant, overwhelming that resistance. Ultimately, it takes a long time, and then the thing is built, right? And they create the walkable communities and the denser uh, living mixed-use areas. What is the reaction in the community communities like afterwards? Are they happy that they did it? Do they regret it? Do they say, yes, we need, we need to do more? I can give you an example. I was uh, Avalon Bay Rockville Center. My firm represented Avalon Bay on that, and it took years and, and a litigation. I wasn't there at the time. <laughs> um, we represented the board. I'm sorry. And we represented the board. Right. And it took a long time. <laughs> it took a long time um, to get it, it, it done, and it was finally done and built. And then, uh, and now from what I'm hearing, I don't live in Rockville Center, but uh, it, it it rented up quick. It, it, it's it's still generating people do like it from the community so I think the response is positive it's just getting the shovel in the dirt is it so positive that they say we did this one let's think about everything's one. case specific a lot of, I mean so, they doing a new one now so you have the yeah, phase two. yeah well phase two I think is already up isn't it I think it's is, there a, is there a new one in Rockville Center? Avalon, uh, David Warburg from BHP chopping in because we worked with uh, you folks also mm -hmm. on Rockville Center too. Mm -hmm. So uh, the major challenge and the litigation and the, the real headache came with <laughs> Rockville Center 1. Well, started yeah. with another developer, Avalon bought in while it was still in dire straits, I think, right. and built it. And when Rockville Center 2 came along, Moved through the process very quickly because we had paved the way because the doomsday that people were so no, afraid and it was a scale came. issue too. So and the scale was working. Yeah, it's different. But Rockville Center two uh, went through the process very quickly and painlessly from the developer standpoint, and I think it broke some kind of a record for Avalon yeah. as far as how fast yeah, that they, they, they 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 it was one of the, it was, go ahead, thank they you. The tie in the overlay districts and the affordability component, generally do the overlay districts consider inclusionary zoning so that you do have a set aside of affordable units? Or yeah. Sure. And, and <coughs> that's a case by case basis too, um, but yes. Is it generally, what's the income range, what's the percentage of It's usually 20%, that's okay. what we're finding. Of is, the, is it graduated? Is it, 10% at a certain level and 10% at another level? or is it You know, it really depends on the community, okay. Evan. It depends on the community. It depends on the um, what the municipality thinks the need is. I think it just, it, it really, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Is it generally that you can start off with the knowledge that inclusionary zoning is going to be uh, part of it, or you start off? Uh, no, I don't, I think it, like, it still depends on the community. I, like. Old Westbury and Westbury are two very different communities. <laughs> so, you know, it would depend. It would just depend on the community. <laughs> so, uh, wine damage was a lot more aggressive. Isn't it like 40? 41%. Affordable. Affordable. Oh, oh, not number of units, but I meant in terms of the uniform. Level. It was like it depends on the building. 40% of the unit. It's not required by, by code. I think it was 20. Uh, it, it depends on the building. One is 40% and one is okay. uh, 80 and I, I think the interesting thing they did there was they did not change the design materials or finishes. You're not allowed. To. Yeah. <laughs> I think our time is up. Well, that'll answer. I want to. I want to thank our. our I just remember them. And thank you all. <laughs>